you to the uh, TTUISD Math Science Club. This is our second webinar and it's concerning our techniques, fireworks, and explosives. So to welcome you for joining us today for those of you that are just now coming online. I'd like to introduce ourselves. We have some club coordinators. I'm Tracy Clinton, the technology coordinator, the one running the webinars and the, ones, the one that actually sends out the uh, uh, email links for any of our webinar registrations, as well as taking in any kind of comments that come in from students and from attendees of the webinars. So we also have a science coordinator, which is Sharon Story, and we have uh, our math coordinator is Pam Summers. So we'd like to welcome you today. I want to remind you that our first webinar that covered forensic ornithology, um, that webinar has been recorded, and it is that is now posted on our web page, um, which uh, that way you can watch it at any time that's convenient for you. If you happen to miss that first webinar last month. Just a bit of our uh, WebEx housekeeping. I just want to uh, familiarize some of you that might be new to our webinar system that this is the environment that you're looking at with the presentation on the left. And then on the right, um, you'll see the participant chat window and a Q&A window. To get started today, though, it is important that uh, you verify that you've got the necessary media players for our videos. Um, if you have not done so by now, please make sure you choose the help menu and that you choose the verify rich media player option. That's then going to allow you to ensure that your computer has all of the media players necessary so that you can watch the videos um, as we uh, hit those during the presentation today. If you have any kind of questions, we would like to ask that you do all of your questioning through the chat box. That box is so that you can ask questions. As I can answer those, I'll answer those during the uh, uh, presentation. But then at the end of the presentation, I'll also take those questions and we'll uh, make sure that we get our presenters to answer some of those for us or those questions that we don't get to, we actually put on our blog on the website so that you can see the questions and the answers from our panelists. So please use the chat window uh, for any of the questions that you might have. And I'd like to turn it over now to Pam and Sharon and they can tell you a little bit about our sponsors. Again, we want to thank the STEM program here at Texas Tech um, University. It's through NSF grant that we have been able to provide you with the, the Math Science Club, so we hope you're going to enjoy it. Remembering always that science, that STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. To a look at how science, technology, and math are all related. If you're interested in technology, there are lots of fields that you can go into, including science, so that you could be a specialist there. If you're interested in science, look at all the things that you can do with science. But you can't do science without math, and so math is very important to also. We're going to look at explosives, we're going to look at fire, and we're going to look at the uh, classes that you need to take and what some of the occupations are that go along with those classes. We hope that you will know today that during our session, please pay particular attention to in science, we're going to look at projectile motion with our physics, and we're going to look at the colors that you get from fireworks. So that is our chemistry. In technology, we're going to look at uh, computer synchronization with our fireworks displays and how you can put music with uh, fireworks so that you can make the displays the Halloween, even in the 4th of July. Even in math, we're going to look at quadratic functions. Well, the shapes that your fireworks are going to make. I know the shapes are very important. Mouth, so will you just shut your mouth and do what I ask you to, please? I did. We're trying to program I over now. We're very honored to have Dr. Weeks attending with us today on, as our, one of our specialists. Dr. Weeks is in, uh, an associate professor in the, in the chemical engineering building at Texas Tech University. His credentials, as you can see from the screen, are just are on, very enormous and are very widespread. Friend, so we're going to turn the mic over now to Dr. 
Doctor Lee. Be here. Hi, Doctor Lee. Mm-hmm. Just one sec, and I'm turning the Qualifications. Really okay, fine. but he works with high explosives for the History Channel, radio, public radio, and all those things. He works with the high explosives. Good. Well, Thank you. Tell a little bit about yourself and how you ah, wound up at Texas Tech. Certainly. So, I mean, my background, I did my first degree in chemistry at the University of Texas. And from there, I, I worked for a little while. I joined the Air Force and got okay. involved with the mining and mining industry is probably the biggest user of explosives in the United States. So everybody knows explosives and bombs, but the reality is what happens is still kind of learning how this work I have done anymore. Are, are right. for you know, non-peaceful purposes. And when, when you look around you, you know, if you look in the room, yeah, like it's out, yeah. the story goes, if it hasn't been Yeah, learned, but I had to call on the phone to get the... So These were in the conference, so I don't know. The wall material, I mean, I'm sure they have, like, the paint, the oil that goes in your car, all that's not. I think it's a web conference. It's not real, I mean, it's not like they're in front of real people. I know, like, so I got really interested in explosives from the Move here, <laughs> bigger. structure of engineering the client. And from there, I went to the school of the UNC Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah, that's my school. Would you put things on top of my shirt? I did. Yeah. Yeah. They touch it. You know, you oh. go there expecting to get an education, you come back with a family. So my yeah, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Why always room from, one on one. from there, I went on to work at Morris Livermore National Library. Everybody knows the Alamo class. It's just a random first one. It's just a random first one. You know, Morris Livermore is a little bit of a shovel. And I just finished. Something should be going on. So no, I was all there may not for about four years. years. And after and a couple of days, they would start pumping as well. This did come up. You know, the two things years. came up. So now I'm in the chemical well, think engineering we've department. Seen that for a long time. Or well, well, maybe something wrong. Yeah. They're delaying. Okay. No, I'm telling you what so might have happened. Oh, Richard, what are you doing? Trying to be helpful. I, I, I guess that gives you a, a me be very helpful. simple overview. And probably the easiest thing to do is to show you some videos. But Dr. Weeks has provided for us, and we're going to download that video, and then he's going to explain it to us. Yes. All right, so that video is actually from a coal mine. It's, I don't know the exact place, but it's in the mine. Those are the biggest things for production of coal in the U.S. Well, they can hear it. And what they do there, the coal is not very deep in the ground. It's under what they call overburden, which is the top layer of earth. And the, the coal seam, the amount of coal below, may be 30 to 50 feet thick. So they don't dig under the ground. Can you reload the page? More coal under the ground in terms of... Is that what they do? They just remove yeah, the So they dig down... Is this one on me recorded? And again, the easiest way to do that, you can imagine somebody with shovels trying well, to... I'm just saying if they... Yeah, then you can go back um, then and go back there. front end loader where they scoop up the overburden move out of the way. But the easiest thing to do is to blast it. So when you're watching that video, and I don't know if you can play it again or you can watch it later, you see that all these explosives doesn't go off at the same time. It goes very slow. It starts at one end where there's the least resistance, then each charge goes off one after another. And then it can push the overburden in a specific direction that you want. So this is similar to how they take down a building. They don't put the entire building in one go. They selectively shear or break different support pillars inside building to make it fall how they want and where they want. Right? 
Well, tell us what happens to all of the dirt that goes to the bottom once they had blown it up. I mean, after the dirt is removed, so then you've exposed to new coal seam. Well, after the dirt's been blasted, then you've exposed to coal seam. So it's, it's you know, at that point, with large front end loaders, they have all sorts of different excavators to remove that overburden. They, they've got what they call wheel bucket excavators, and if you have a chance to look one of those up on the web, they're absolutely amazing machines. It's a big, uh, ten buckets on a big giant wheel, and each one of those buckets is the size of a house. And it'll pick up the dirt and put it on a bare belt, and then that exposes the coal. Then, you know, if you want to have the coal, same thing. They don't just go down and dig with shovels. They'll blast the coal and then scoop up the coal and up to the, the refining aspect where they either produce heat fuel or coke. And what, what coke is, everybody hears coke and thinks it's a drink or something else. Coke is the type of coal that they use for production of steel. And this almost exclusively comes from the eastern part of the U.S. And what they do there is just like making charcoal. They take the coal out of the ground and then essentially heat it up to remove some of the small lighter molecules. Then you have a, a type of coal, now called coke, that burns at a really, really high temperature. I'm so that everybody can see it. And I, the dirt they remove, do they, what industry do they use that dirt in then? They'll, they'll, they'll backfill, right? So uh, if you want to play the video, or if you want me to talk over it, but it's, it's um, the thing is, is a series of rows, right? So they'll make a row. So at the bottom here, that's where their coal is that they're removing. So then when you go off, it's going to start at the far end. Filled in that area where, with the dirt, they just moved it to the side. They filled in the area they've mined with. Well, I'm probably. But they, you can see how it's sitting there. They filled the area that they've mined with dirt. So essentially, what they're doing is, is move the dirt. So they don't have to remove it all the way. Just move it over to the side where this mine the material. And then remove the coal, and they just keep doing this like like a set of stairs. So one step at a time, they they be overburdened before they remove the coal, remove the coal, and then do it again. So they're moving sideways. And just move dirt every 50 to 100 feet to the area that they just mined. So they were high uh, high speed uh, demo, uh, demo de yeah, thank demolition. I'm going to let the video have just a minute or two so that it can load up on everyone's machine. It's a pretty fast load, but I just want to make sure I'm going to stop it in here and give us just a, a couple of seconds here for one's machine to load up that video so that hopefully everyone's watching it in sync with us. Just a sec, and then I'll start this video in a couple of minutes. And Dr. Weeks, if you'd like to talk about what they're about to see, uh, feel free to chime in. Yeah, so this this one here is um, looks more quarry, and yeah, if you start, there's some some big math and physics that goes on. So on the bottom part of your corner, you see bottom what would you say bottom left, you see a flare area, and then there's little mounds of dirt right on the edge. Each one of those is the hole they drill the blast. And the way that they find out the spacing of these holes, they need to know how strong the rock is that they're going to move, how far they want to move it. And all the type of explosive that they're going to put in. So the science behind even drilling holes, they don't just drill randomly. They very specifically with what they want to do with the rock. So if you have granite countertops in your house, um, you don't blast a very thin piece of granite. They blast a nice large piece of granite and they cut it down. But they blast, they don't want to break it into little pieces. So they'll space the holes differently than they would have in this video where they're going to try and break up the rock in small pieces to try and make it easier to move. All right, so the, the shot here, so whenever that goes off, they call it a shot. The shot's going to be on that far wall, and you can see it going off. And here, I mean very specifically how things um, occur to move the rock as they want. 
So the first holes, the one in the middle, in the, the rock starting to move, they create and multiply space closer together. So there's that first break that the rock can well, start moving it. forward. Then after they've done, then the whole top of the side start going. And, then and then that just allows you to break up the rock I hit the specifically and accurately. And these guys that do this work are very good. Uh, you can almost tell them what size rock that you want. And so would that be important when you're making a road you typically want the small pieces of stone to go into the road. Or if you're making a breakwater in the ocean, they call it riprap, you want large boulders to break up the ocean. The ocean waves are coming in. So just these explosives, the scientists and engineers that do this blasting can make the stone almost any size that you want. It's very important that things always work correctly, and so you have provided us with a video in which the building doesn't, or the explosives don't totally work. So we're going to do this video and then let you explain what it was that they did incorrectly. And we're going to give just a couple of minutes for everyone's uh, video player to load the video so that um, everyone watched it, and so then Dr. Weeks, if you'd like to talk about um, the video they are about to see, I'll start it here in just a, a minute or so when I'm seeing that everyone has it downloaded. All right, so before I you know, you, you can look at lots of videos of, of things being imploded. That's what they typically call it. So an implosion as opposed to an explosion means things are going to go out. Implosion, you're going to try and make things go down. So essentially have the building fall upon itself and break up. Again, you know, you, you can tear down buildings and when things get old, they, they've got to be removed. And small buildings are pretty easy to take care of. They've got wrecking balls or they use check hammers and just break them up. What if you have a 50 or 100 story building? You know, you, you have a wrecking ball that can reach to the top and pieces of glass and stone and brick are going to fall on the, the people below. So it's very quick and relatively simple to remove building by blasting, which removes the support structure. And, and again, yeah, but, but if you download some of the other videos, almost always you'll see at the beginning some yeah. bright flashes. Those are not the explosives going. That's them timing the detonators that are going to set off these explosives. You see these flashes, nothing happens, you hear things start banging. So if you look at them before where they use timing, to move the rocks, they do exactly the same thing in the building. They use timing to remove the building support in a very specific order to make it fall in on itself. Now, white flashes and there's a long break. So this is the key aspect. They need to make sure that every detonator is and ready to go before anything starts happening. Because if you think about this huge building and you know the blast is going to occur over many seconds, as soon as one pops, a piece of rock stone, brick, uh, you don't want to hit the other detonators or the priming charges that you're using to stop the explosive reaction from happening, right? So this is, the, you can see what I think I'm hoping, is this is where they didn't time things correctly. So. I, I wouldn't want to guess exactly what happened there or, or make any comments to people, but uh, you know, if you watch that closely, everything goes off at one time. There's just one explosive charge. So whoever designed that, what they did probably was set up all the explosives go at the same time. There's probably none around the building that hoped that it would fall over and then break apart. And what normally they do with something big is have explosives at different levels. They have something at the top, and black men would start falling on itself, and they'd blast them at the bottom. So if you look at some, and there's plenty of videos all over the web, you'll probably see that. If you look at these big, large buildings, every, say, 10 stories, you'll see a big break where it looks like they, they removed extra material, or there's a big gap, and it seems like holes are missing. What, what they try and do is go into the building.
building ahead of time and remove things manually, say with a tractor, so they'll break specific pillars inside the building, but it's still strong enough to stay up. Then they set these explosives to break the last remaining pillars to break down. So you know, the, the, the point of that is things don't always go as planned. And now you've got a big problem. You've got a building leaning on its side. Nobody's going to be allowed to go into it. And then taking that building down now is, is. is a very difficult process. What we do with a building like this is to make sure that it, it is taken care of or it implodes correctly. You know, videos and, and when you see things on YouTube or Wikipedia, uh, the, the, the always give us Wikipedia. You know, if you wanted to say something, let it go and check back 15 minutes later. You, know, you, you never know really what happens to things. People make judgments. And you know maybe they set it up right. Maybe the, the, the series of charges at the upper level just didn't go off. I, I don't know, but typically and what they do is have a charges higher up in the building to blast it to start removing the top to fall in on itself, and charges at the bottom. But in this case, just from the video, it looks like they only had charges at the bottom. Uh, you know, this is a you know from what aspect do scientists, engineers. If you're interested in going to college do with a demolition type project, you know, it's a whole series of different science and engineers that are involved here. So one of the civil engineers, they need to know how the building was built in the first place and make the decisions of what pillars need to be removed and destroyed as you go on. Um, they have mining engineers, typically with mining and mining, because that's where the biggest experience in high explosives is, is from the mining side. So go in and set up charges. And the explosives work in a number of different ways. You know, if you think of it from a, a broad standpoint, people think explosives like a bottle blowing up that, that, you know, things just go everywhere. They can be directed. Some of these explosives cut by mine. Uh, they're focused. They're very, very small amounts of material, and then they'll cut the pillar in a specific way in the direction that they want. They can also put very small holes with them. You have different charges that oh. make holes, and these are typically used in wells for perforated wells that the oil can seep and be pumped to the surface. Uh, so you, then you can go a little bit further. You, you've got the chemists who um, design the explosives. You've got the engineers that manufacture the explosives. And, you know, electrical engineers that would deal with the timing circuits to help build these. Thank you for your expertise, which none of us would have had. I want to thank you for being with us today and looking at an area that uh, is very seldom looked at. So now we're going to look at the chemistry involved in the fireworks. Sure that it's okay. But what we we have Dr. Dominic Consadante from the chemistry department here at Texas. Tech University, and he's going to tell us a little bit about fireworks and what he know, what he does in the chemistry department. Get the mic, so we'll see if Dr. Casadante, if you can uh, hear us, uh, you are ready to go. So Dante was having some technical issues um, from his end up, so I'm going to give him just a minute or two and see if uh, he can uh, actually come through with the audio so that we can hear him. Give us just a couple of minutes to see if we can get that technical issue fixed.
got some technical issues with uh, Dr. Costa Dante, but we do have Dr. Weeks. Um, he has, uh, his wife is here with us for a presentation. I'll let him tell you a little bit about her. She is a member. She is a staff member in the chemistry department here at Tech. We're going to use her expertise today, and maybe as you ask questions in the blog, then we can forward some things to Dr. Costa Dante. I'm Louisa Hope Weeks, and I'm actually on the faculty in chemistry. Um, I want to know a bit about me. I guess largely it's the same as Brandon, as he mentioned. We met in graduate school over in the UK um, at Cambridge. I came over here as a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, I'd worked in the Advanced Materials Group, and so I got interested in um, plastic materials around that time. And and so since I've been tech, we've been working largely in this area. So um, I guess I'll talk a bit about fireworks. Um, fireworks has been around, in fact, they're one of the oldest uh, forms of chemicals since they were originated in China about 2,000 years ago. They were brought over to Europe by some of our early travelers. Um, the sources were discovered um, as John said here, 9th century during the Song Dynasty, so that was nine, about 900 to 1200 um, years ago, not years ago, that would be a long time. Um, I've been thrown into this, just to, as you know, for the, for the, uh, on the cup I was only visiting. So, these fireworks actually were invented by accident, and that is most probably how it happened when a cook just happened to mix charcoal, sulfur, and salt pizza by accident. So the first quite dramatic firework display. Okay. Uh, yes. Hope Weeks, is that correct? Yes. And how fireworks got back to Europe? And, and the different parts of the country? You, um, and I said it was our early travelers that really brought them back to Europe. Uh, Marco Polo is actually credited with bringing Chinese gunpowder back to Europe in the 17th century. And since it was up to Europe, they developed applications, mostly military purposes, and the first rockets and cannons were used and based on that powder that Marco Polo brought over. In fact, there wasn't a lot of um, drum development in the area for years, and we were quite happy to work with that powder that he brought over. Uh, the Italians were the first Europeans who used that powder to actually manufacture fireworks that we use today. The colors. When you look at a fireworks display, you see the various colors that go on. Can you tell us how those colors are made when you look at fireworks? So you get the colors that appear in fireworks are from doping of the firework material with a metal-based compound. For example, the blues and greens are often copper complexes that are in the firework that actually give you those red colors of light. And so um, the greens come from that. And there are some others, um, other metals, sodium, for example. And it's kind of based along the same principle as your lights in the street where the orange sodium lights grow, glow on rather than white because they're filled with sodium. We do the same principle in um, explosives by using compounds of different metals that give you these different colors. Are they all salt? Pretty much they are all salt, yes, yeah, that we put in. You've talked a little bit about the sodium and the fact that the sodium gives us the yellow or the orange colors. How do you get the various reds and the purples and uh, the, the oranges that go, the oranges you said were sodium, but various other colors that go with it, the blue? The blue is copper salt, um, and then uh, lithium gives you those red colors. Uh, sounds very easily to, are easy to get. Are they compounds that are uh, regulated? No, pretty, they're, they're, they are easy to get. They're not regulated. 
the ones that give you the color. How do you make the various shapes that are involved in the fireworks? The shapes that are involved in making the fireworks, kind of like the star prisms and things like that. Actually, I, I'm not an expert on the fireworks manufacturing process, so I don't know how they do that. Oh, so, um, Brandon's sitting right next to me, and he's uh, explaining to me on the fly as we go here that they're actually um, the shapes are assembled inside the fireworks process, um, during their manufacture, and it's how they're assembled inside, they're in the circular shape or um, what shape you're aiming for, gives rise to the shape you see inside. From one participant is how does the modification of the mixtures ex uh, affect the explosive properties of the gunpowder? Sorry, repeat that question. Modification of the mixture affect the explosive properties of the gunpowder. Uh, so the modification of the mixture and how does it affect the explosive properties of the gunpowder? Um, that, that's a very kind of very broad statement. I mean, obviously, you can affect the mixture enough to make it no longer necessarily a pyrotechnic and more into an explosive if you wish. Um, you can add more colors, you can mix colors to give various shades, um, to mix metal sorts to give various shades. Um, you can you know, incorporate more energetic to give you more um, power in your explosive, but then you're kind of bordering on changing from making a pyrotechnic to making actually an explosive material. asks, does temperature affect the color of the fireworks? Does temperature affect the color of the fireworks? It, it can, but not really. It's more the actual chemical composition of the molecules that make up the fireworks, or the salts that make up the fireworks. Octopus also asks, what color calcium would burn? Calcium. Yeah. I'm not sure actually off the top of my head what color calcium salts would burn. I think our Dr. Casadante texted us back and said that calcium would usually burn orange. When you look at the period chart, are the colors in a uh, family or in a group, are they all going to burn the same color? No, no. They're not all going to burn the same color, no. Within a family or group, no, they won't all burn the same. And helping us out, especially since we're unable to connect with Dr. Cardante, and we now uh, have a video we're loading, and so we're going to load that video, and we want you to watch the synchronization and the technology that's involved in fireworks shows.
favorite videos to watch because you can see all of the different colors of the chemicals involved. The blues for copper, the reds from the strontium, the oranges are the the whites that are probably sodium. But the main thing that you need to watch from this is the synchronization with the music and how how your music fits your synchronization or fits your fireworks display. Dr. Weeks is going to talk to us just a little bit about the physics that's involved in this because without the physics, you you don't know exactly how to set your projectiles or how to set your charges so that your fireworks will go up to the correct height. So Dr. Weeks, could you talk to us a little bit about how they do that? So first of all, you need to actually understand how fireworks, as we've discussed before, how the fireworks are actually packed determines things like the, the color that will be released from that firework, how long those colors will burn in that firework, and how long the firework will remain active. And also how it is packed determines at which angle each of the kind of spots or offshoots is going to come out of that firework. So they need to know all of this as they're actually playing with their music and tying it to that music to determine how the charges are set. And it's a very big um, operation. Actually, control of fireworks display like we've just seen, it actually has to be computer controlled, actually allow the timing of each firework to go at exactly the right time. And obviously, the time at which the firework goes and fires is already predetermined by the firework or the orientation in which it's laid down um, to work. I can watch the video because I know I'm going to go back and watch it again because it is one of my favorites. So go back and watch it again. I want to look at the physical principle of reflection. Why do you think that the fireworks display was set out down at the bottom of the lake? And what does reflection have to do with the display of the fireworks themselves? And how does it make that such a, a beautiful process? We were excited to have both Dr. Weeks with us today and his wife. And we could have never done this presentation without them because they've added so much information to our knowledge base. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a video in which fireworks go on. And this is one that you probably have all heard about. And this is one that is very important, probably in Michael Jackson's life. And today, and then we're going to look at it. And I want you to notice that this is something that just didn't happen automatically. This is something that this was the fifth um, that they had ran this uh, particular simulation. They were trying to get their timing down correctly. But five times before previously, everything had worked just 100% correctly. Now watch what happens on the sixth time. Like a couple of minutes, because I am showing that we still have some attendees that their machines are downloading that video. So please just be patient with us. We want to make sure we capture everyone. But I'd like to remind you also, if maybe if you have a slow connection to the internet or a slow connection on your computer. Um, I want to remind you that you will have the webinar recorded link sent to you. It will be available off of our web page. So that way, um, if there's problems with viewing the video uh, in our real time, then you can uh, actually watch it uh, through the recorded webinar link that will be sent out. So I appreciate you taking the time and the patience to wait for, for all of our attendees. We're just running with lots of different systems and lots of different downloads. Time. So we'll give it a couple more minutes. Looks like only about two more attendees need to download the video, and then we'll get started and let you watch how uh, the, the fireworks actually goes wrong in this in this part of the video with Michael Jackson.
up for this more, maybe just a, a few more, just, just a short amount of time. I'm showing two attendees still downloading. We'll start here shortly and uh, play the video and then we'll move on. Probably one of the most famous videos that's around about pyrotechnics that went wrong. It's that Michael Jackson's class on fire. They're using this at his trial as one of the areas that is causing him to have the sleep deprivation that he's all of the medication for. What we want you to be sure that you realize is that pyrotechnics are not something to play around with. That they can go wrong and they can do bad things really fast. that happens around the 4th of July, everybody likes sparklers. Every big sparklers are very, very safe. What you notice from this slide is that the temperature of sparklers burn. They're 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Fatter than glass melting. They ever have a little kid, a two-year-old or a three-year-old brother or sister, or even a niece or a nephew, and using sparklers, please, please make sure that they're not around anything like the gasoline in the garage that you're using for your lawnmower. Make sure they handle them correctly. And you want to watch them closely because they can catch one of those little sparks from that sparkler can catch their clothes on very quickly. And then what happens is you have a really bad situation. Be your How is it when you're handling your fireworks? Of course, thousands of people, most often children and teens, are injured while using consumer fireworks. The raw fireworks injury is more than twice as high for children ages 10 to 14 as for the general population. So, what we do now is we want to take this and want you to uh, think about the topics that have involved today, how physics and math are involved in fireworks, how you have to have projectile motion the colors that are involved in the fireworks, the technology that is involved, because you have to have the synchronization of all of the different uh, uh, What is the relationship between you vector, velocity, projectile motion, and all of the explosive forces that are behind the, the patterns that are involved? There is a website that we've put on uh, our, our presentation that you can look at that gives projects that are safe that you can do, that you can look at, and you can see exactly how much fun that you can have with your uh, projectile motion and with your physics. This particularly, will use some statistics and some tables, and it will allow you to actually use your graphing technology. So if you have graphing calculators that you're always wondering, how does this apply real life? Here's an opportunity where you actually have a project given to you that you can go through to see how it works with fireworks. Look at the technology that you can look at. And we can build your own fireworks, and it can be totally safe, and you can build your own display. We have given you a, a, a website that has a simulation on it. And this allows you to experiment with both the colors that is involved in the fireworks, the physics, because you can use your angles and you can your size of your uh, projectile. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this just very briefly and show you how this works. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to this website. And at the very top of the website under properties, you're going to click under properties. 
click on properties, that will allow you to change the loss decay of the randomization of the property. You can change your fuel, you can change your pickle decay, which means rapidly your fireworks are going to go off. You can change the weight of your, of your fire. You can change your explosive factor. You can experiment with these and you can run all of that. After you've done that, you can go and look at your burst chart. You can you have three charges that are set. So that you can change and you can have one of them be particles, one of them be glitter, one of them splash, flash, spread, streak. You can have rain or you can produce a fountain. So you can set your, your burst charge for each one of these various displays. Also, look at the bottom two before you do that. You see the button under curve? You have a red a green and a blue, you can check that white bar that is in there so that you can put more red in your color, or you could put more blue in your color on your fireworks, or you can put more green. The bar that is down at the very bottom that goes across, right underneath your color, that is the color that when you blend them, that's the color that your fireworks will produce. And then you do your amount, you have amount, amount one, amount two, and amount three. So that you can have more of color number one. You can have more of your burst charge number two. You set percentages by fighting that bar from left to right. You want to make one sure that one thing sure, and you want to make sure that you use your math correctly. Because we all know percentages cannot add up to be equal to more than 100. So the question is not what you make. I'm on 155, I'm out 255, and I'm out 355 because that adds up to be more than 100%. So you have to uh, choose your three first effects of your three curves. When you get through those, your amounts will all have to be equal to 100%. Add those the way that you want them, then you're going to hit the launch button. Launch button. You're going to come to the screen that says Fireworks Simulation, press a pause. Press P to pause. When you press the P, the P will unpause the simulation and it will start your show. And then when you start your show, it go and it will give you the different bursts on a screen. Down at the very bottom, you see the overall gravity or the wind force. You can slide that bar from left to right and change your gravitation or your gravity. You can change your wind force so that that will change the direction that your fireworks display. Oh, if you click on it and pull a line, it will allow you to reposition your fireworks. If you get rid of this and you decide that you just don't want to do it and you just want to look at it, then you can go back to the original screen and up there where it says fireworks, you can click on the fireworks button and it will automatically do you a, do a simulation for yourself so that the computer will do a simulation for you. But it really is a lot more fun if you will pull with it and look at your various factors that you can uh, manipulate and you can make your own fireworks display. Then you really get good, you can save it and you can put your own music with it. So you can use your iPod and you can use the tech key. And you can make fireworks display just like they do whenever they're uh, setting up the 4th of July. And you can play with it and see what songs that you can do fireworks to. I want you to look at the number of songs that y'all really like today. In my generation, Kiss is one that used lots of fireworks whenever they were on stage. Now, uh, the Katy Perry uh, video that is at, look at the number of fireworks that she uses and look at the colors that she uses. Also, Taylor Swift was in the class this weekend. Taylor Swift used a lot of fireworks on this display in her show. One thing, though, is also think about the precautions that they have to use in order to make fireworks. By looking for a career that's exciting and fun, that uses science and mathematics and technology, what would it be to be a stage uh, a former for Taylor Swift? One of the examples of things that you can explore from today's presentation. We hope that you all have gained lots of information. None of these careers are uh, none of these careers are achieved without some type of educational background. So look at educational background that is necessary for this occupation or for this field of study. What are some of the coursework that is necessary for success in this occupation? Not only are we going to look at chemistry, but physics, math. You have to about geometry. 
You have to know about uh, algebra. You have to know calculus in order to work in these fields. Not only is that going to be important, you are responsible for a lot of people whenever you do these displays. So you have to look at the safety and how safety plays a part in pyrotechnics. How is the music industry involved in pyrotechnics? Do you know with the videos that are coming out, everybody tries to achieve a more uh, spectacular video. So they're only going to use pyrotechnics. Where would that be in a career? Look at Disney World. Look at Universal Studios. Look at Six Flags. All of those have massive pyrotechnic displays during Christmas, the 4th of July, in the summer. Uh, pyrotechnics is the only career path that you can see from this presentation. As Don Weeks told us, it's not. Look at your explosives. Look at mining. All of those are going to be important careers that you can explore. Okay. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Weeks and uh, Dr. Casadante, although he was unable to connect with us today um, through his, the audio. He will actually be answering the questions for our blog. And I'd like to thank Dr. Brandon Weeks, his wife, for stepping in and kind of giving us some insight as well. Um, I'd like to remind you that we have uh, emails listed here for the contact uh, for Pyrotechnic Guild International, Effects with Fireworks, uh, as well as uh, our speakers today. Uh, please forget that we do have a follow-up blog. They'll be available. So if you want to go to our website, that link is there also off of the TTUSB Math Science Club webpage. Uh, submit your question. That question will come to me and I'll forward it on to our uh, speakers and let our panelists go in and answer those questions. I'll post those questions and answer them for you as well. I want to also remind you that we have an upcoming webinar next month. It's going to be covering actuarial science, which is traditional life insurance. We have changed the time on that webinar presentation so we can help maybe um, spread out the times for students that are currently in a regular school or in public school, or maybe the noon hour is not a good time to connect. Um, so next uh, month on Tuesday, November 15th, we'll meet at 5 p.m., that's Central Daylight Time, for our actuarial science traditional life insurance. I want to thank uh, all of you for attending, uh, especially uh, for wait times on videos to make sure that those came through. A reminder that I will post the link to the recorded webinar on the web page so that you go to that um, to watch this webinar at any time that's convenient. Um, I'll also send out an email that's got the link for the recorded webinar. So if you miss a, a website about the project by students for students, as well as um, some of our other websites that we had in this presentation, then you can uh, see that in the recorded webinar at your convenience. Again, I'd like to thank you. I know our time is up, and we want to uh, hopefully uh, see you next month, number 15, for the next one. Thanks again for joining. Yeah, it said a teleconference, but I don't know.